Lord, and thank you that uh, we can get to come to worship you this morning together, Lord. Thank you for um, just our fellowship that we have together, Lord, as we worship you, as we um, as we chat together, Lord, as we uh, pray, Lord, as we sing, Lord. Would you minister to our hearts, minister to our souls, Lord? Um, would you bring refreshment, Lord, and encouragement this morning by being together? Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. You are faithful to us. Thank you, Lord. We worship you this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
you'd like to give your tithes or offerings uh, today, there's a box at the back of the table. You're welcome to give that way or online as well. Just a reminder that we do have the uh, Forward in Faith um, fund <laughs> that we're raising money for for our uh, next gen pastor for our youth and young adults pastor uh, that's joining us at the end of August. It's exciting to see uh, God provide that way, and uh, we'll have an update for you next week about how that's going. Um, also, next weekend is the Big Give on June 1st. We're doing a family fun day. Who's Woo! excited? Woo! We're going to have our church be part of that and putting it on to bless our community, to be generous to our community. Um, we're going to have a bouncy castle. We're going to have a barbecue. We're going to have face painting. We're going to have free things, bubbles, all the fun stuff. So invite all your neighbors. Invite people that you know that might uh, have a great time just being part of that event. Um, that is on Saturday. And then on Sunday next week, it's Potluck Sunday. <laughs> Potluck Sunday. So don't forget next week, bring some food to share. Uh, bring some food to share. Um, we had Gary Thompson's funeral yesterday. It was um, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, reunion <laughs> of people. So it was, it was beautiful to see. Um, and there was a lot of beautiful food that was that was got and we'll have leftovers today. <laughs> That's a little preview of potluck Sunday for next week, okay? Anyway, so um, we're, we're so thankful to be able to share and fellowship with one another over food. It's such a blessing that God has given us. Let's stand together and continue in worship.
that you can build your life on him, that he's your saint in his presence. Sing it, rain. Rain. scripture today comes from the book of Romans chapter 8 verses 12 through 17 therefore brothers and sisters we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it for if you live according to the flesh you will die 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Morning everyone. Lovely to see you this morning here at Cornerstone. Uh, my name's Dan and I'm the pastor here. This is your first time uh, here at, at our local church, our, at our little uh, outpost of the kingdom of God here in North Gore. Uh, I have a memory um, and it was being sat in a room in a field in the Netherlands and uh, across from me was a Brazilian guy, a young Brazilian guy, and uh, I remember it being very hot. The air was stifling, um, and I tapped my pen on the clipboard in front of me as I looked up and I asked him this question, uh, what was the darkest moment in your life? Uh, Between 2012 and 2016, as personnel manager on the missionary ship MV Logos Hope, twice a year, I would fly across the world from wherever the Logos ship was to either Germany or the Netherlands to meet the people who would soon be joining the ship. This was a chance for uh, me to get acquainted uh, with the the new recruits um, and also helping them to get introduced to... uh, the Logos Hope and uh, our parent organization, Operation Mobilization at OM. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, it was a chance for me and my, uh, my, m- my team, my, my female personnel manager, to get to know them. And so during my couple of days that I was in country, I got, I got to sit down with each male recruit and each couple um, for an interview. So my time in the Netherlands was just in this hot room, having interview after interview. And this interview served as the last stop in a lengthy application process that for some had taken months or even years. And if you've applied to a missions organization and thought it's not been going as quickly as you like, then then I totally empathize with that. But as I came out of each interview, I would start to build uh, a picture in my mind of what the individual was like and where I could place the interviewee, um, which role I could place them in on the ship. Would they work in the deck department? Would they work in the engine? Would they work in the book fair? Would they work in the galley? Would they be part of the cleaning team? Um, That was one of the main purposes of this meeting, but there was another purpose to this meeting as well. Um, Because I knew what life was like on board when you cram 350 people from 60 countries into a metal box 132 meters long and 20 meters wide for two years. The ship was a pressure cooker, uh, some said. The ship was like all Christian communities. It was good from afar, but it was far from good. All the promo um, material made it look shiny and new, but we knew the reality. And so it was my and my team's job to really discern if there was any potential trouble brewing for the future. In other words, was the ship the right place for them? And that led me towards the end of my interview to ask them this question, uh, to, and specifically to ask this young man from Brazil the question, what was the darkest moment in your life? It was an open-ended question intended 
to give me a quick insight into those moments in our lives that might not come up in interviews like this. It gave me a chance to forecast what things in this person's life might squeeze out sideways when living in a cabin with someone who they don't got, get on with or during hour six in an eight hour shift in the galley when the AC in the ship has failed and people are complaining about the food again. This was a useful question for me. And so it was a question I asked of all our new recruits. And it often took the conversation in a completely, you know, different uh, way than what we imagined as as we, we dug through several layers of polite conversation very, very quickly. That's if they trusted me enough to be honest in that moment. And so I wonder if you were sat across from me in that field in the Netherlands in that uh, overly hot room and I asked you that question, what was the darkest moment in your life? I wonder what you would answer. I wonder what you would say. I wonder what your response would be. We're going to come back to this later, um, but I'd like to read a couple of verses from our lectionary scripture this morning one more time. And as I read it, I want you to listen and uh, observe how the Holy Trinity relates to us who are in the family of God. Uh, Of course, as I've mentioned, as you've seen on the screen, uh, today is Trinity Sunday. And um, and, uh, as I read this scripture notice what family or relational terms are used so let's look at verse 15 Um, and by him we cry abba father the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are god's children now if we are children then we are heirs heirs of god and co-heirs with christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory Romans 8, 15 to 17. Let's read it one more time all together. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, as we read that through twice, I wonder what you noticed. You know, did you notice that the way that we relate to each member of the Trinity, of the triunity of God, is mentioned in those three short verses? Well, first of all, what we see is this, that we are children of God, that we are children of the Father. This is one way that we relate to the Trinity. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And then again, uh, moving down a little bit, rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. We are adopted by God into his family with full rights as his children. That's incredible. We are also co-heirs with Jesus. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That's not saying the same thing twice. That's two ways that we relate to two different members of the Trinity. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Not only are we adopted by the Father, but we are siblings of Jesus Christ. I wonder how often you pray to Jesus as your brother. We say Lord, we say Master, we say Savior, but do you ever say Brother Jesus? We are co-heirs with him. All that is coming to Jesus is coming to us. We are co-heirs. And finally, so we're children of the Father, we're co-heirs with Jesus, and we're confirmed by the Spirit. And by him, the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. What does that even mean that we cry out by the Spirit? Now, I'm not exactly sure what it means that, that, that we cry by the Spirit, but it seems to me that there is this amazing and intricate relationship and maybe synergy that happens when we cry out to our adopted Father God because the Spirit at that moment is crying out with us. And he 
He confirms us. He testifies that we are God's children. He testifies to the world. He testifies to our doubting hearts. He testifies to God himself. And he testifies to the malevolent spirits around us that we are God's. We are children of the Father. We are co-heirs with Jesus. We are confirmed by the Spirit. We are triple protected. We are triple wanted. We are triple embraced and we are triple secured. We had a youth game a couple of weeks ago where one team had to link arms and stay together while another team tried to tear them apart. And Meredith was incredible. Meredith wrapped her arms around her friend and she was grimly holding on while outside forces were trying to tear them apart but Meredith held on and she screamed from the bottom of her lungs I've got you I've got you her face turned redder and redder and redder but she did not let go it was intense and this is an incredible image of um of how God has us. He has us with love and intensity. Only it's not Meredith holding us. We are triple protected by God himself. The Father says, I've got you. You're my child. Jesus says, I've got you. You're my sister. You're my brother. You're my co-heir. And the Spirit says, I've got you. I'm confirming that you are God's and that you're okay if you're in Christ. So we've brought to light this amazing, almost unbelievable truth that we are children and heirs of the Father, that we are co-heirs with Jesus and that we are confirmed by and cry out with God's Spirit. I hope we're starting to see how the Trinity is invested in each of us individually and also us as a church universal, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Trinity as a community of persons wrapped up in the one God is committed to your spiritual well-being, to our spiritual well-being. The Trinity is committed to helping us get through life. Amen. We're legally adopted by the Father. Our legal brother is Jesus. There's no question, there's no doubt. And when we call God Father, Abba Father, when we know, truly know that God is Father, that he's our dad, it's the Holy Spirit joining with our spirit, enabling and empowering and releasing us to say this. But then we come across something that could well stop us in our tracks, something that pulls us up short, like when you're walking along a path and then suddenly something runs out in front of you. You're not sure what it is yet, but you just have that instinctive reflex, that reaction. You stop, your heart starts to speed up as your lizard brain tries to decide whether to flee or to fight. And then your mammal brain kicks in and you make sense of the scene in front of you and you realize that it's just a robin. It's okay, it's just a robin, and so you continue your walk, and the robin flies off. Now let's read verse 17 uh, one more time, all the way through, and see if we can't see that thing that I think stops us in our tracks. There's a little clue, it's highlighted on the screen. Now if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, do you see that on the fifth line down on the screen? Now, I don't know about you, but I see a conditional there. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. If we do this, suffer, then this will happen, glory. In other words, seems to, seems to be saying no suffering, no glory. At least that's how I see it. When we're walking along the path of promise as children of God, co with Jesus, crying out and confirmed by the Spirit, we see the glory ahead, the glory that is promised. We, we talked about that yesterday at the funeral. Um, this, is the, this is what we like to talk about. 
But then all of a sudden, something jumps out in the path in front of us and it makes us jump because we weren't expecting it. And this thing, this species is known in the wild by its Latin name, conditio biblicus. A biblical conditional. Actually, I made that phrase up myself, but it sounds pretty good. <laughs> Were you impressed? Okay. And these biblical conditionals can bring us up short because we're not expecting them because they seem out of place and our choice when we read a biblical uh, biblical conditional like that in, in a passage like verse 17 is either to turn back because it startled us or we can incorporate it into our journey and we can carry on and it gets even more complicated when the conditio biblicus when the conditional is suffering if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, why does this conditional cause such us, cause us such strife? Well, really, probably because we're not sure why suffering is a condition of being a child of the Father, a co-heir with Jesus, or being confirmed by the Spirit. Why is suffering a condition of glory? If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Or as the NRSV U E NRS NRS view, I think that's how you say it. This is the new translation of the NRSV. Um, and the NRSV came out of the ASV. So you have the ASV, which is the King James, and then you had the uh, ESV and the NRSV that, that came out of that tradition, and then this is kind of the new version of the NRSV. But this is what it says, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. How can we make sense of suffering being a condition of being in God's family? You know, does it mean that if we have an easy life without stress or persecution or struggle, then we're not adopted? And would this mean then that if we have a hard life full of trials and anguish and pain, then we are automatically adopted? Is there a minimum suffering threshold that we have to meet in order to be in? And if so, does this mean that God somehow glories in our suffering and pain and uh, that as he sees a struggle, he's rubbing his hands gleefully as he claims us as his own? And the answer is, of course not. That's horrendous. So how can we understand this conditio biblicus? How can we understand this biblical conditional of suffering? Well, I have three suggestions. Number one, it is a call to endurance. The Roman audience that Paul would have been writing to would have not been strangers to suffering. The church was a mess. You see, the Jews had been banished from Italy five years earlier, and now they were allowed to return, but the Gentiles had moved in. I was trying to think of a, a way to explain this, and it's like, imagine if we all had to leave, and then all the Quebecois suddenly moved in, they made themselves at home, it's already happened, I see Stacy there, <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and, then we, and then we returned after five years to a very different church. Nothing against people from Quebec, this is just probably our closest um, uh, way to understand it. But there were cultural and ethnic tensions and challenges. In other words, there was suffering, there were challenges. Any of you who've been out of relationship with someone else know the suffering that comes with this particular territory. And in verse 17, perhaps Paul is calling you to endure, to not give up. And a verse that maybe backs up this understanding is Acts 14, 21 to 22, which says this, when they had preached the gospel to that city, made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So it's a call to endure, maybe. Suggestion number two is it's a call to remember. Paul is calling the church in Rome and by extension us to share in the sufferings of Jesus by remembering it. He's calling us to recall and revisit the pain of the garden of Gethsemane and the pain of the cross to remember the cost of our redemption 
if indeed we share in his sufferings. Maybe that's what it means. Because as we remember the suffering of Jesus, of our co-heir brother Jesus, our willingness to suffer for him increases. We see this principle laid out clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2, 20-21. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So maybe uh, this... this, this um, this conditional of suffering is a call to remember. That should be suggestion two. We're called to, to remember. We're called to consider. We're called to fix our eyes on Jesus and let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Maybe that's why we are called to uh, suffer, is we're called to remember, to consider, to fix our eyes on Jesus. And even as we sit around the Lord's table, this principle comes up again in Luke chapter 22. He took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So sharing in, this, in the Lord's, sharing in Christ's suffering as a condition of adoption could be understood as a call to endurance. It could be uh, uh, understood as a call to remember you know, each of these are good, solid reasons why um, that as co heirs with Jesus, we're part of a new family, and that as we pass through our old neighborhood of this world, the people who are stuck in the old system aren't going to jive with us anymore. There's going to be a disconnect which could lead to suffering. I uh, remember when my younger brother Josh wasn't a Christian yet, there was a fellowship that I could not share with him you know, the deepest part of who I was as an heir of God, a co-heir with Christ, and is confirmed by the Holy Spirit. He could not relate to that. But when he joined God's family, that all changed. Suggestion number three is this, a call to not go it alone. A call to not go alone. This third suggestion really is the logical continuation of the first two. As we're called to endure in our suffering, as we're called to remember the suffering of Christ, we are also called to not go it alone when we suffer. Now, we're going to get into a little bit of maybe technical stuff here because I don't like how the NIV words this. I find it less helpful in this particular case. The NIV says this, if indeed, indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share with his glory, share in his glory. You see, almost all of the other translations have a different feel to them, um, a different logic. So we see uh, in the New English translation, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorif glorified with him, English Standard Version, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, New American Standard Bible, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him, and then the NRSVUE, if we in fact suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. These are all saying pretty much exactly the same thing. That's not exactly the same as what we see in the NIV. So here's where I'm, I'm, I'm going with this. The NIV seems to place the, the focus or the importance on the suffering of Christ. We share, the object is his suffering. We share in his sufferings. But the other translations don't make this overt connection, okay? The um, that it's about sharing in his sufferings. In, in the other translations, the suffering could just as easily refer to us as it could to Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that suffer could refer to Christ or it could refer back to us. And I think that this is important because the NIV makes uh, Christ's suffering the object of the preposition. But the other translations make Christ himself the object of the preposition. Okay, I bet you didn't realize you're going to get English class this morning. If we suffer with him. In the NIV, we're called to share in the sufferings of Christ. 
but in the other translations we're called to suffer with Christ, which of course could mean sharing in his sufferings, and absolutely that is a part of it. Or it could also mean Christ sharing in our sufferings. We suffer with him. And I would argue that the very next verse verse 18 confirms this because Paul immediately then talks about our sufferings. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So listen to verse 17 again with this idea of allowing Christ to share our suf- uh, to share in our suffering with us. If in fact if we in fact suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him, if we in fact suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. In other words, one way of understanding this is to say, don't go it alone when you suffer. Instead, suffer with him. Don't block Jesus out. Don't go it alone. Keep an open communication with Jesus as you suffer. Keep praying. Keep pouring your heart out to him. Even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, even if you feel that your prayers are so raw and unvarnished or even inappropriate. Hear this. The only inappropriate prayer is one that's not prayed. The only unacceptable prayer is the one that's not prayed. So keep an open line of communication with Jesus and with others as well. You know, remember that Romans was written to a church, not just to an individual. And so all this is summed up in our sermon summary this morning, suffer with Christ, not without him. To revisit our picture from earlier, suffering is not so much a conditional that stands in the path. If you don't suffer enough, then you're not going to get into the kingdom. Instead, I would say that suffering is the path, but we get to walk this path with Christ. He is the object. Even though I walk through the darkest valley of suffering, I will not fear, for you, the object, are with me. Suffering is a given. It's a promise. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. But in our suffering, we're called to endure in our journey of pain. In our suffering, we're called to remember the journey of suffering that Christ endured for us that culminated in the cross. And in our suffering, we're called to not go it alone, but to suffer with Christ, not without him. And the reason that we can do this is because God is our father, because we are his adopted children, that Jesus is our brother, that we are co-heirs with him, and that the spirit is our confirmer, And our co-crier is through the Spirit that we get to cry out, Abba, Father. And so it's in this context of this Trinitarian powerhouse family that we are called to suffer with Christ and that we are enabled and empowered to suffer. Because what happens then is that our suffering is not our defining reality. Instead, our heavenly family is our defining reality. So let's listen to this passage one more time as I read it slowly. And feel free to have your eyes open or to have your eyes closed. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, or preferably, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may also share in his glory. So, what's the takeaway this morning? Those of you this morning who are in God's family by faith, know that you are children of God. You're co with Christ. You're claimed by the Spirit who empowers you to call out Abba Father. And, that, and know that there is a condition attached to being part of this family, and it's to suffer with Christ, 
as we endure, as we remember his suffering, but primarily, but primarily through choosing not to go through suffering alone. Because the one who invites Christ into their suffering, who opens the door to Jesus on the most painful part of their life, is the one who clearly demonstrates that they are part of the family of God, that they trust their brother and their co-heir, Jesus. So the question is, are you going to go it alone in your suffering, or are you going to suffer with Christ? Because suffering is a given, but you can suffer with Christ, or you can suffer alone. Now let's close our eyes for a moment and uh, and just like that new recruit who sat across from me in the Netherlands, Jesus is sat across from you. So let's just close our eyes and just have that image in your mind that Jesus is sat across from you and he's not the the personnel manager of a ship, he's your co-heir. And he's got the kindest look in his eyes. But there's also a resolve there as he sees the suffering that you've experienced, the harm from the hands of, of others and the voices of others. He sees the pain that others have caused you. He also sees the pain that you've caused others. And there's a firmness and a no-nonsense attitude about him. Because he sees the effect that sin has had on the world and on your life, and he's angry. He sees the ruin that Satan and sin have brought on planet Earth and your life. His righteous anger and his desire for justice is strong, but he's kind. He's kind, and it's the kindness of one who's been there, who suffered at the hands of others, It's the kindness of of one who is the ultimate safe space, safe place, safe person. And this kindness is kindness with a backbone because he knows that there's hope on the other side. He's conquered our mortal enemies, Satan and sin and the grave, and he's risen victorious. So this kindness is kindness with a twinkle in the eye, And he gives you this invitation. He says, tell me about the darkest moment of your life. He says, tell me about the darkest moment of your life. He says, tell me about the darkest moment of your life. He says, tell me about the darkest moment of your life. He says, tell me about the darkest moment of your life. And you know that he's not asking you out of morbid curiosity or a desire to expose you or embarrass you. He's asking you because he wants you to suffer with him, not without him. And he's your brother. And so friends, on this Holy Trinity Sunday, Abba Father is on your side. The Holy Spirit is on your side. Brother Jesus is on your side. When we cry, Abba, Father, it's that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Suffer with Jesus, not without him. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you how some incredible truth turns on a phrase. And Lord, I thank you that, uh, that this path we're walking along, um, that you admit that it is a path of suffering, but that, ob- that path is not the object. That is not the focus. The focus is not the suffering. The the focus is Christ. The focus is Jesus. The focus is you. And that we get to pass through the valley of the shadow of death with you. And we get to fear no evil with you as we suffer with you. Show us how to do this, Lord. Show us how 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 to tell you the darkest things in our lives so that we can let you in 
so that you can suffer with us and lead us through to health and growth and maturity and freedom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.